Well, thank you so much. Uh, I've heard so much wisdom tonight. Uh, I hope I can add something to it. Uh, let me just briefly uh, address some of the points that were raised from the floor. Uh, raised from the floor. The uh, mentioning the USSR, um, I think, was an excellent, uh, excellent point because again, we saw the problems of refor reform, and finally, the state. It took uh, it took eighty. It took seventy years, but it did collapse. Uh, the Islamic Republic has been there for 44 years. Um, I hope we don't have to wait another 36, year, uh, uh, another 36 years. But there was a story that was going around uh, uh, in the Soviet Union which, which asked, raised the question, how do we reform ourselves? And the response was, well, there are two ways. There is the realistic way and the fantastic way. One way is that Martians will come down and with their advanced technology and superior knowledge fix everything. That is the realistic way. <laughs> the, the fantastic way is that we might do it ourselves. Uh, on the matter of intervention, I, I find myself agreeing with one, one of the floor uh, speakers and disagreeing with the, with, uh, with the, with the other. Uh, as far as the U.S. is concerned, uh, intervention um, in places like Iran and Iraq have not ended, we uh, have not ended well. Um, I personally took part as a serving official in uh, what was euphemistically called Operation Iraqi Freedom back in 2003, and I, you could see from the beginning, uh, the results did not go, the results did not go well or as, pl uh, as planned. But to the point, uh, personally, I, I would much rather be sitting on your side. I would much rather be arguing, be able to argue that yes, the Islamic Republic can reform, and this is, but this is, a, this is a purely personal preference. As someone with 60, almost 60 years of very deep ties to Iran. I want to see something better for my Iranian friends and relatives. I want to see them have a government that treats them decently. All of them, particularly the women. I mean, it's no, it's no accident that the, the current slogan is women, life, freedom. <laughs> and here we are. I would like to, uh, but what I would like and what should happen and what can happen are two different things. Uh, the other point I would make is that I think we have finally learned <coughs> that th there's, there's really no education when a mule has kicked you for the fifth time. <laughs> That's happened to me. I have been wrong more times than I would like to think about Iran. And most of, the, most of the reason I've been wrong is because I've been too optimistic. Well, maybe, maybe we finally learned. And I hope it doesn't take another kick of the mule. But let's look at the history. Uh, the problem for me, as I see it, is that uh, it's been the very nature of the Islamic Republic. Because the revolution, back in 1978-79, what was it about? It was about making Iranians at long last masters in their own house, which they felt they were not. The problem was, at the end of the day, which no one could agree on, is which Iranians were going to be the masters and what kind of house was it going to be? Now, the followers of Ayatollah Khomeini and his vision, they had an answer. And it was that the answer was, we are going to be a theocracy that controls all levels, uh, all levers of political power and economic power. But not only that, unlike previous dictators, we are going to control the private lives of our people. So we are going to tell you what music you can listen to. 
We can tell you whether you can play chess or not, what, whether you can watch a movie, how you can, how you can dress, how you can, how you can speak. All of these things we are going to control. And this was, I think, shocking to many Iranians because in the summer of 1979, when I went to, I went to Iran on an ill-fated mission uh, to serve in the American embassy, the question everyone had uh, in the street was, uh, in Persian was, in Akemidan, when are they leaving? When are they leaving? Meaning the clerics, the, cl the, the clergy, because this wasn't reasonable. This wasn't possible, what was happening. So they had, they had to leave. Well, here we are 44 years later, and they're still there. Uh, because what happened? In 1979, very soon after the fall of the Shah, a ruling clique took power and has kept it ever since, by all means. We all know their names. Beheshti, Hashmi Rafsinjani, Mahdavi Kani, Janati. Some, uh, a friend of mine says that their average age now is deceased. <laughs> but some of them are still around, and if they're not around, their acolytes are. And if holding on to power meant the meaningless and bloody Iraq war, goon squads, mass executions, the flight of millions of people, a worthless passport, a worthless currency, and even making nice uh, with your historic enemy, Russia, as Chiba Doshmane John Amshoda Amdus Naduna. Why, why have I become, why have I become friends with the enemy of my very soul? That's what the, that was the question, that was the question. And over 44 years, um, the Islamic Republic has not reformed, despite efforts during the Khatami years and at other times, because those who hold the real power, not, not the people who hold the titles, but the real power, they don't want to change anything. And why not? Because what they've learned is that if power corrupts, absolute power is a lot of fun. <laughs> so why should they give it up? And why are they afraid of it? Why, why do they imprison people like recently, someone, Behishti Shirazi, Mr. Sami B, Mr. Momini, who even taught, bear, have, the, have the audacity to even think about reform. That's how afraid they are. And I think the reason goes back to something in Khomeini's thought, something he expressed very early, about all the way back in one of his early writings, uh, where he attacked, of course he attacked the usual suspects, the Jews, the Baha'is, the this, the that, the, mon the, the Shahs, but his special venom went to so-called Islamic reformers. People who said you could reform, you should, we need a reformed vision of Islam. Those were the enemy. And we've seen that. We saw his, in his relation to the thinker uh, Muhammad Ali Shariati, more recently his hatred of the Mujahideen al these he sees as uh, Islamic reformers, and basically what he doesn't like in them is anti-clericalism. Because there is, in Iranian culture, and Khomeini knows this well, a very deep strain of anti-clericalism. Love the religion, but hate the priest. And Khomeini, first and foremost, knows this and feels it's the danger. Well, so what happened? Same, what has happened? The same group of men, and they're all men, and their acolytes, have been in power since 1979. The, 19, the decade of the 1980s was the height of their power, but they're still around. And the basis of their power was enforcing Khomeini's, I have to call it this, idiosyncratic ver vision of an Islamic state. And opposition, and their opposition to reform was simply a cover for this historical anti, uh, to, uh, cover, uh, 
I'm sorry, that their opposition to reform was based on the view that reform equals anti-clericalism. In other words, people who talk about reform, what they really want is to get rid of us. And that they cannot tolerate it. So these men have kept power for 44 years. They've demonstrated, and they've demonstrated that reform to them is an existential threat. Why should they change? They will not. Thank you.